Many people have big life questions. Are billionaires evil? Will robots rule the world? Donde esta la biblioteca? But the only way to find the answers is by speaking to the experts or reading the information. No one has time for that. My name is Rhys James, and I'm not an expert, but my diary is empty. I'll ask the questions you don't think to. I'll get the answers you didn't know you wanted. What's the matter with you? Don't you know anything about science? I'll do the research. As in research. My name is Rhys. It works written down. You're through to research. Please leave your name and question, and I'll have an answer for you within one calendar week. Beep. Yeah, do you think seeing as humans have ruined the environment and made all the animals like, run away or whatever, do you think we'd ever have to live on Mars? What if I told you about a place that hasn't got a single costa? That's right, space. The sea of the sky. For as long as scientists can remember, space has been looming in the background like a big tall boy. In the early days, it did nothing for our tiny Neanderthal brains except give us the sneaky option of nighttime and offer something for wolves to scream at. But gradually, human intrigue got the better of us, and nowadays, space is so well known it has its own Wikipedia page. Space exploration has changed drastically over the years. In the past, when so-called scientists would tell us things they discovered about space, they had to qualify it by saying, trust me, I've been staring at it loads. Nowadays, we have the technology to just go there ourselves and see if they're lying. But could we live there? Some say we already do. But will we need to leave our current home of Earth after we've melted it to a slop to start life on a colder planet that will take longer to burn? Enter Mars, the red one, Diet Earth. According to the rumour mill, Mars is habitable by human beings. So far, all we've sent there is remote control cars to drive around and see if it's hilly. But in years to come, could human beings find themselves living on Mars? Building homes there? Queuing for the bogs? Wolf whistling Martians? Wondering what it would be like to live on Neptune? Or is this just a pipe dream for people who recently fell out with their Earth friends? In order to find out, I spoke to Andy Weir, who wrote a book called The Martian about a man who gets stranded on Mars, which was later turned into a film nominated for seven Oscars which was later turned back into a book with Matt Damon's face on the cover. Andy, can I ask you something? Yes. Is it even bloody possible for humans to live on Mars? Well, sure. Thought so. I mean, humans can live anywhere where we can create an environment that'll support us. So, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't be able just to walk around naked on the surface, but if you have a base or something to support you, absolutely. I don't think I asked about nudity. I don't know why you've brought that up. You can be naked in the base if you want. I mean, that's your business. Again, I didn't ask. I mean, we're trying to get on track here. What's the environment of Mars? And don't say it's like a nudist beach. So the surface of Mars ranges between zero Celsius and minus 100 Celsius. The atmosphere is almost a vacuum. It's about 1% the uh, pressure of Earth's atmosphere. It doesn't have a significant magnetic field to protect you from the radiation that comes from space. So yeah, generally uh, unpleasant. Generally unpleasant, Andy Weir, TripAdvisor. Now, how would we survive on Mars? I mean, to begin with, where would we live? It depends on the population. If you're talking about like early settlers, then you probably have like a bunch of little domes or inflatable habitats. But if you're talking about centuries in the future, then there'd probably be large cities. So you're in all the time, but it's kind of like being in Heathrow. It's a very large structure that you can wander around in and, and not really feel too cramped. Ah, that sounds fun. So, so what materials would we need to make these domes or this Heathrow? The very first groups of people who would be there would probably be in inflatable habitats because those are the easiest things to transport. Uh, but later on, when you start building like kind of permanent structures, you'd probably gather resources from the environment, then you can make solid rigid structures, and then you cover those structures with basically Martian soil mixed with ice. Turns out that water, ice, is a really very good radiation blocker. So if you just put like a layer of that on top of your dome, then you'll be pretty good from the radiation. Ah, so does this present a huge business opportunity for property developers to get in first and be <laughs> the big moguls on Mars? Uh, well, yeah, no, because um, Mars is a planet. Planets are very large. Whoa, whoa, whoa slow, slow down with the science. Let me get a pen. It's not like real estate's going to be in short supply on Mars. And so actually, you've kind of touched on one of the biggest questions is, why the hell would anybody go at all? I mean, every... Andy really got me thinking. Why the hell would anybody go at all? In the past, exploration on this level was to try and get spices. 
Britain conquered half the world in its pursuit of spices, only to decide they just want salt and mustard for every meal and look back on centuries of wasted journeys. Mars is spiceless. Frankly, it's bland. Sure, its surface may look like paprika, but that's just a trick Mars is playing, so you go and visit. So what's left as a reason to go to Mars, other than being bored of Earth and sick of Chessington, or weighing a third less without having to go jogging? Well, business. Andy says the property on Mars won't be worth anything, as it's not in short supply, but if you look at a picture of Mars, there isn't a single block of flats on it. Plus, as Mars is only half the size of Earth, the property will be worth twice as much. This was clearly a good opportunity, and if Andy couldn't see it, I was confident one of the UK's premier property developers called Alan would. Hello? Alan, I've got an opportunity for you, and it's out of this world. Who's that speaking? Listen, now maybe you'd be interested to hear. I've recently come into this opportunity. It's a vast, spacious area. I believe you're in the property business? Uh, yes, that's right, yeah. It's a rare situation where no planning permission is required here. Now, what right. I'm talking about is a place that's got great views. It's close to the beach. It's south-facing half the time. It's pretty much damp-proof. I mean, yeah. does this sound appealing to you so far? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It has unlimited storage space? Yeah. Unlimited storage space. It's in a safe and quiet area. There's no noisy roads, no train tracks nearby, no noisy neighbours. In fact, you aren't overlooked at all. You've got complete privacy. Now, I don't right. know about you, but I would absolutely love some complete privacy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. So do we have a deal? Well, I need to know the location that we're talking about. It's north of London. Right. Um, as I say, close to the beach. So is this Essex then? Are we talking... It's not North dissimilar to Essex. So, I mean, can you tell me the address? This is going to shock you, Alan. It doesn't have an address. Uh, but it okay. is also free from all pests. So, you know, you've got to take the rough with the smooth. Right. Uh, I mean, if it doesn't have an address, it implies it's not registered. Yes, actually, there's sort of no rules where it is. It's a lawless land. And the way it works law-wise, it basically, if you grow a potato there, you make the rules. It sounds like what you're talking about is agricultural land. Is that right? It's a place with a very different atmosphere to what you're probably used to. It's... Have you heard of Mars? No, I... no it's a bit too, too um, far out for me. Which uh, areas do you mostly focus on? Ilford... Woking, Chichester. Ah, but not space. No. Alan, I'm sorry for wasting your time. I hope you find someone else who can... Uh, thanks for the call anyway. Thank Bye. you. Goodbye. There you go. Is there an element of Mars being more appealing because its days are closer in time to Earth? Well, there is that. It's this cool cosmic coincidence that Mars's rotation period is almost the same as Earth's. So the days on Mars are a bit longer. You have an extra 30, what is it, 37 minutes? Uh, 39, I think. You have an extra 37 minutes on Mars a day. So what happens to, say, 24-hour deodorant? Do you have a 40-minute <laughs> terrible period of the day where you stink? Uh, I don't think deodorant has, like, a fused timeout quite like that. Well, you you know about science. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, Could you even have deodorant on Mars? No, uh, deodorant only works in 1G. Mars is 0.4G. I mean, you spraying don't it? you know anything about science? Surely if you're spraying deodorant, it would go up. It would go up. It wouldn't go straight <laughs> into your armpit. It would then travel up because of the gravity situation. Yes. Well, also, I mean, the gravity is like 0.4. It's not zero. Okay. They would go diagonally up. Yeah, I think, oh, I no. think, I think you'd probably work it out. I mean, the velocity of the mm. particles coming out is... Mm. I'm sorry for all of my further answers will be deodorant related, mm. Reese. So, okay, I'm sure you'll manage. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to get Right Guard in there or Old Spice, but Old I... Spice is an aftershave. Try to keep up. Right. Well, I'm going to have to have an intern fired now. Some pros and cons for living on Mars. I'd like to run through with you to see if you agree. Mm -hmm. um, pros: you don't have to go to any baby showers, but cons: you cons. will have to go to some meteor showers. <laughs> well, no. I mean, Mars isn't significantly more endangered by meteors. Okay, just pros then, I suppose. <laughs> Another one. Better Wi-Fi, of course, because you're closer to space. Um, cons, closer though... Closer to space? Well, you didn't... It's... Do you think Wi-Fi comes from space? <laughs> well, of course it comes from space. I mean, that's what the, <laughs> comes from satellites. They're in space. So is Mars. But ergo, you get better Wi-Fi, surely. I'm, I'm going to let that go. What's next? <laughs> well, cons, you can't bobsled. Why not? There's ice on Mars. There's snow. Yes, but crucially, Andy, there's no bobsleds on Mars. And even if you remember to pack yours, surely the gravity would be too low to bobsled. Yeah, it's 0.4 Gs. It'd be enough. 
It would be enough, yeah. but you wouldn't be able to go as quick. Sure, yeah. It would take you longer to get up to speed, but if you make a good bobsled run, absolutely, you can bobsled. I'm all for it all of a sudden. Yeah, all of a sudden. So bobsledding is what Well, so I don't want to get bored is the thing. I don't want to go to Mars because I was worried you wouldn't be able to play darts, for example, because, you know, they're just going to... Of course gonna, you can play darts. As soon as you release it, it's just going to go upwards and you're going to have to change your whole tactic. Once again, Mars has 0.4 Gs, not 0 G. You throw the dart, it won't arc as much, but it will still arc. What's the matter with you? Do you know how gravity works? Yeah, of course I do. It's something to do with E-numbers. Now, how about this? Pro. Currently on Mars, traffic and crime are at zero, okay? Which makes it a that's, very that's true. very desirable place to live. But upon humans going there, traffic and crime would increase. Now, would you really want to move to somewhere where you know crime is about to increase? <laughs> um, yes, because maybe I want to commit the crime. Very interesting. Maybe that's an opportunity for me. Is it going to be a planet of criminals? Maybe I want to be the first Martian mob boss. Exactly. I mean, that's basically, you've just described Australia, right? Ah, so once again, we don't need to go to Mars. We just need to go to Australia. We just need to go to Australia. Australia. Have you grown weary of the noise of life? Do you feel heavy with the weight of the world? Do you find there's never enough time in the day? Not enough days in the year? Not enough years in the cupboard? Well, maybe what you need is time to discover new surroundings, to build a new home, to run a little bit slower. Come to Mars with the beautiful red sandy landscapes of North Mars, to the sandy red terrains of South Mars. We can enjoy a local cuisine like nothing you've ever tasted before because it's powder and your taste buds are buggered. Come to Mars, where you'll never again worry about the small stuff like turning up late or looking bad in shorts. Where we can sit and enjoy a blue sunset. Where we can bobsled at almost full speed. And together, we can let it take our breath away. Just me and you, not just me. Come to Mars, please, please. Oh, and bring an iPhone charger. Terms and conditions apply cannot be held responsible for entire loss of luggage and or life. Definitely not at all protected. Andy, with anything like this, there's a chance it's a one-way trip, so that might mean there's some reluctance to go. So should we send people who might not want to come back, like the clinically embarrassed, say people who check their reflection in a car window only to realise there was someone there looking back at them, or people who accidentally click reply all on an email, or people who sent a dick pic to the wrong cousin? Should we send these people? <laughs> well... No. <laughs> also, I don't think that major government entities anyway, like NASA, for instance, they don't do one-way missions. So if there was ever going to be a one-way mission to Mars, that would have to be in the private industry. And I think that would come well after the government-funded ones. OK, well, it takes, what, seven months to get there? It takes about eight months, a little more than eight months to get there. So it takes seven months to get there. So should we send people who could use that time with no distractions to really get some work done? You know, someone who's got a dissertation, say, to write without wanting to be distracted by their PlayStation. <laughs> well, uh, I think the people who are actually going to Mars on that spaceship are going to be so busy maintaining the spaceship and doing checks, double checks, triple checks. Quadruple checks. Making sure everything's working correctly. Quid double checks? Yeah. Yeah. Well, sure, the driver would be busy, but what about everyone who sat in the back? Are you saying they would be busy as well? <laughs> Correct. That's right. One way people are selecting who goes to Mars is by gamifying the experience. Elon Reeve Musk recently held a contest to pick an all-civilian crew to go to space. Jeffrey Preston Bezos sold a seat on his space flight for $28 million, even though you have to sit next to him and it only lasts 11 minutes. And in 2011, something called Mars One was created, a mission to select members of the public to be the first to establish a permanent human colony on Mars. The process included an interview, a general knowledge quiz, and a series of tasks to complete until the finalists were selected, sort of like a space version of The Apprentice, or a task master. Also, I want to point out Mars One is a, is a joke. I mean, I've never understood why people took it seriously. Sorry, I didn't I... realise you were still listening, Andy. Um, let me just um, mute. There we go. With Mars One going bankrupt almost immediately, this left an opportunity for me to set up a new Mars One, a sort of Mars One Two, where I could select my own team of astronauts to go to Mars and test roll-on deodorant. I did this by sticking posters up in my local laundress asking anyone interested in going to Mars to contact me. We had just one response. Applicant welcome. So, tell me. 
How come you want to go Mars then? Well, well, I suppose it's the romance of it, the sunlight on a on a new planet, um, to be at the forefront of human exploration. That's that's that will drive it. Now, I'm not being funny, but what are some of your strengths and weaknesses? And if you're smart about this, you'll leave the weaknesses out. Oh, um, I don't get phased by red, um, and I'm a mixer. So we get you know chat to people. Who are you? Where are you from? Uh, what do you do for a living? I, I think I can do that stuff. You've got that in the armory in case yeah. you did bump into any sort of Martian. You could ask them what they do for a living. Yeah, I could. And I, I'm more met with the people I'm traveling with. And also I'd, know, I'd hold back some stories for the later part of the journey. So so the people that you're traveling with on this Mars mission, you would ask them, what do you do for a living? Yeah. Oh, wait. Right. Is it kind of not? Is it? Is this what we were doing for a living? They're, they're astronauts. Clearly, they're astronauts. But oh, no, okay. but if that's going to be your level of patter on the Mars mission, that's good to know. Duly noted. What okay. do you do for a living? Who are you? What's your name? I mean, you're seven months into a journey and you're still asking that, are you? Yeah, well, look, they may remember something that they, they didn't remember earlier on. Now, I've got a series of scenarios here for you. These have been specifically designed to test your question answering, your English, your question listening and your internet connection. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Scenario one. The Mars 1-2 mission invites you to interview, but midway through the first question, you realise the interview process is actually just a choose-your-own-adventure, akin to something from a children's book. This makes you suspect that the mission may not be legitimate at all, and could in fact be hoodwinkery. Do you, one, leave immediately, opting not to move to Mars, instead continuing your stale and honourless Earth life? Or B, throw caution to the wind and continue, despite the fact the interviewer keeps putting the word Mars in air quotes? Uh, uh, uh... B? You have chosen B. B, yeah. B. You pass the early doubters test, designed to rule out anyone not trusting enough. But you fail the early trusters test, designed to rule out anyone too trusting. You're allowed to continue, but only if you provide a £200 one-time early limbo fee. Um, okay, you have... I get, I think I gave him my card details already. Um, do you want to just take it off Yeah, that? scenario two. You are selected for the Mars 1-2 mission in a team of four and are invited to meet the fellow astronauts you will build a new life with. Upon arrival, you are faced with four figures in spacesuits whose faces are obscured by their mirrored glass visors. The boss arrives and says, one of these got to go. Which one you're dropping? And asks you to select an astronaut to cull. Which one do you get rid of? Five, four, three, two, one. Lift off. Little joke for you there to lighten the interview. But what I mean is one, two, three, four, or five. Which one are you getting rid of? One of which is you. Oh, do I know who me is? You don't know who any of them are. You just have the numbers. Oh, um, I wasn't expecting the difficult decisions to be made. I'm not great with difficult decisions. The... You didn't expect difficult decisions to be made on a mission to Mars? I, Good I'm b- God. <laughs> But, um, I don't know, two. 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 You've said two. 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 Are you sure? Two. I'm, two. Two. I'm, yeah, two. Two. You have chosen two. The suited figure steps forward to remove their helmet. It's famous trained astronaut Tim Peake, whose years of experience would have been invaluable to you. The boss wonders why you decided not to ask any of the figures any questions before selecting one to get rid of, such as, who are you and are you a professional astronaut? However, it is now too late. And as the final team remove their helmets, standing in front of you is your ex, then your partner. And your mum. Um, they have heard all my stories. Now, Andy, Andy Weir, with regard to creating future cities on Mars, is this with the idea to create a sort of Earth 2 that has all the things Earth has? Bowling alleys, pubs, and stuff like that. That's, or- that's where you go first? Bowling alleys. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's the pinnacle of human accomplishment. Um, Laser Quest, <laughs> Namco arcades, pool tables, chiquitos, red, white, and blue shoes. You swap your shoes for dance mats, nachos. Aerosolized cheese. Well, don't be ridiculous. Again, that'll just float up when you spray it. But are we going to create Earth 2, or are we going to create new things? Um, I imagine at some point in our distant future, I do believe that we will have a point where the population of Mars reaches one million people, say. And by that time, our societies will have changed a lot. And I think Mars would have kind of its own society, its own thing going on. Mm. Kind of like, here I am. I'm an American. Um, Europeans came over here, killed everyone who was here, and we started our own society. But crucially, you do have bowling alleys and so does Europe. We, we do have bowling alleys and so does Europe, yes. Mm. And hey, when we're colonizing Mars, we don't have to kill everyone there first. I yeah, mean, well, that's what we think. That's... Do we know for sure there's no such thing as aliens and Martians? Yes. Mm. I mean, there's definitely no intelligent life on Mars, and I personally don't believe there's even any microbial life on Mars. This is my own theory, but you could grab just one liter of any part of Earth. You could grab it from the Arctic. You could grab it from the Sahara. You could grab it from the ocean. You could grab it from the upper atmosphere. You could grab it from center parks. You could take one liter of whatever is there and look at it, and it'll be riddled with microbes. You'll see it microbes everywhere. So 
my belief is that life is really good at evolving to occupy every nook and cranny of the environment that it's in. Yuck. So I believe that if there was any life on Mars, it would be everywhere on Mars, in literally everywhere energy is entering the system. Could it be so advanced that it's hiding from us? Um, sure, I guess. And there we go. Sure deodorant. Perfect. Scenario 33. Are, are you sure this is the kind of question that an astronaut would be asked? Oh, I don't think anyone ever promised that. Scenario 33. Now settled into life on Mars, you hear a knock at your door, and as you open it, there's a Martian stood there with a clipboard. Your Earth instincts kick in and you say, not interested, and slam the door. Suddenly you realise you've just missed a huge opportunity to communicate with an extraterrestrial and possibly buy some tea towels. You open the door again, but the Martian is nowhere to be seen. Do you A, search far and wide for the bugger, desperately trying to make contact, or two, don't? I mean, how difficult is the search? Are there footsteps? Are there feet? I mean... You tell me. You just saw him at the door. Oh, yes. Or her, of course. Oh, it sounds like a hassle, doesn't it? I'll give it I'll give it a once around, you know? Are you in this for the right reasons? I'm beginning to think not. But, I think you, know, you are. Do you, you really? I think you are. One last question. Do you still want to go to Mars? Yeah. Okay, well, we'll be in touch. Shall we send some artists to Mars, Andy? Uh, I mean, Listen, so far we've only seen Earth-based art, but how could art change? Jackson Pollock, for example, couldn't create his paintings in that kind of gravity. Monet's landscapes would be very samey. What would Wordsworth have come up with if he didn't have flowers and trees to bang on about? Surely Mars art would be worth a fortune, wouldn't it? Artists and entertainers are kind of useless, right? You don't have space for that sort of nonsense. It's raw functionality at first. It's like... So you're saying there'd be no merit in sending any kind of artist to Mars? We don't have time for Vanity Smurf to be off in the corner, like, doing something stupid. Well, that's a shame because Vanity Smurf does sound like the name of an artist, like maybe like an autotune rap singer or something like that. I mean, I think it might be good to send autotune rappers there on that one-way mission you were talking about about and then just never speak to them again. And if we send them there, we'd be able to hear their songs when they upload to, say, or well, SoundCloud feels too on the nose. No, 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 absolutely. If we're going to send the auto-tune rappers to Mars, we absolutely need to prevent them from having access to the internet or Earth communication in any way. Well, if that's your attitude, you might struggle with this next idea. Now, Andy, whoever gets to go to Mars first will instantly become the most famous person in the world, and possibly even on Mars. I mean, everyone's heard of Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins and that other one. So now we know this, is that a good chance for a brand new influencer or YouTuber like Zoella or, or Logan Paul who can use this boring time on Boring Mars to do brand deals and, and vlogging? No, hmm. it needs to be someone. I mean, the most important aspects that that person will have to have is they'll have to be a good astronaut. They'll have to be extremely well trained. They'll have to know how the ship works. They'll have to do all that stuff. Uh, you know, and for instance, just use your own example. Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong was not a good public speaker. He was this extremely private man, and. Once he got back from the moon, he basically refused almost all interviews, and then he went to live in a ranch in Ohio. Andy is correct. Neil Armstrong wasn't great at public speaking, so much so that it even went wrong in his most public bit of speaking as he stepped off Apollo 11 onto the moon. What we heard him say was, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But he has since clarified there was an error in transmission, and what he actually said was, I guess it doesn't matter how far you travel, you can never truly go on holiday from yourself. Every aspect of selection for an astronaut for a mission like that is about capability and competence. Nothing to do with public appeal. Yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Can you just excuse me for a second, Andy? Good morning, Cole speaking. Hello there. Is this a influencer agency? Uh, no, we don't. We don't represent influencers. Good God! What about some campaigns with them? Do you do campaigns? We we do, yeah. Now I'm sure you're aware of quite how big and popular space is at the moment, and there's a lot of new missions to space. Now I happen to represent someone who is going to space. <laughs> right. Okay. So I'm sure you'll agree that they are going to be huge. You could do any kind of branding with this sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Room tours of the rocket. Yeah. Space shanties. Yeah. These are going to get clicks. They're going to get hits. <laughs> Yeah. This person, I'm not joking, is going to be the first person to step foot on Mars. Now, that is going to make them the most famous person in the world. Do you know who Neil Armstrong is? Exactly. How about one small step for man, one giant leap for tooth kind, an advert for Ibina tooth kind? Yeah. That would be huge, yeah. wouldn't you agree? Yeah, it would, yeah. Now, there are issues, I'm willing to admit that. You can't do unboxings because there's no postal address on Mars and the stuff would float away. But... You could do a sort of twisted cinnamon challenge with the Mars sand, couldn't you? Because that sand is red. Mm. Now, what about ASMR? Do you, do you like ASMR? 
Oh, he's gone. They've hung up. Andy, one final question. Do you want to live on Mars? Me? Hell no. Well, what the hell was all of this then? I write about brave people. I'm not one of them. And I'm definitely... Not I've discovered it is possible to live on Mars. Even to be naked on Mars, if you are inside an inflatable Heathrow. I've discovered boredom is not that big of an issue on Mars, as you can still partake in Winter Olympic sports. I've even discovered that contrary to what experts think, Old Spice offer 39 different types of deodorant. But just because it's physically possible to live on Mars, is that enough? It's technically possible to survive in the Arctic. Should Mars really be next on my list? I mean, I've not even been to the top floor of the Shard, and I live on the fifth floor of the Shard. No one I spoke to saw Mars as a real place they could live, even when I dangled financial opportunity in front of their ears to sweeten the ticket. In fact, no matter how many options I presented, there was only one group of people that Mars expert Andy Weir felt should go to Mars. Auto-tune rappers. Auto-tune rappers. Vanity smurf off in the corner. Do you ever wish you could just get away from it all? Do you ever feel like you're not welcome here anymore? Does it ever seem like Andy Weir is trying to close the door? Well, nobody's perfect. I don't really want to go to Mars. I don't really want to go to Mars. What if I get four months into the journey and realize I was just hungry? Or like sometimes you're thirsty. That's a pretty big mistake, thinking that you wanted to go to Mars when you actually just needed a glass of water. Space! Andy Weir doesn't want me here. Andy Weir doesn't want me here. It's like moving to the countryside. You can't go back to the city or you lose your pride. You just gotta have shit phone signal for the rest of your life. No 4G2 bars, rest of your life. I'm just here to crush your dreams. Your dreams. This sucks. sucks. Andy Weir doesn't want me here. Andy Weir doesn't want me here. I don't really want to go to Mars. I don't really want to go Cool cosmic coincidence. Life. We absolutely need to prevent them from having access to the internet. Research was written and performed by Reese James. With guest expert Andy Weir. Music by Steve Dunn. With material from Adam Hess. Produced by Carl Cooper. A BBC Studios production, mate.